this next session, you'll see Robin Knox Johnston being interviewed by Steve Axel. If you enjoy the session, take a selfie and share your digital festival experience on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram accounts to encourage your friends to join in too. So now, please give a virtual welcome to Robin Knox Johnston. So Robin Knox Johnston, um, welcome to the Isle of Wight Digital Literary Festival, uh, supported by Red Funnel. Um, here we are, first of all, and um, we're going to talk about this lovely book. Um, Robin Knox Johnston, Running Free, and uh, that's a lovely term as well, isn't it? Running Free. Well, I chose it because, uh, that's a good sailing expression, obviously, but it's when everything's going nicely for you. And really, I think throughout my life, I've done most of the things I wanted to do. I haven't got to the moon yet, but everything else I've more or less achieved. We're on board to Haley, which is, has to be, I think, probably the most famous yacht in the UK, if not the world. She's lovely, isn't she, still? Well, she, she's very special to me. I mean, I saw her start as a log in Bombay. Uh, in 1963 and uh, slowly grow into the boat she is. Of course, um, when I built her and then I sailed home via Arabia and East and South Africa. But um, I had no plans at that time to go single handed around the world. It was only when I was in Durban and we had to stop for a while because we ran out of money uh, that um, I heard about Francis Chichester, who I'd heard of from the O-Star but uh, didn't know very much about him. And I heard he was going around the world with one stop, and I thought, gosh, mm, that'll leave one thing to be done. If the French do it first, we'll never hear the last of it. So I wrote to about 52 companies. Now, I was first officer on a passenger ship at the time, so you can't really follow up on sponsorship. So not surprisingly, none of the 52 companies actually said they'd give me anything. But I did get a five-pound voucher out of Cadbury's, and much more usefully, 120 cans of beer out of tenants. So that was the extent of my sponsorship. And they said, well, you know, where's your sponsorship? I said, well, you're looking at it, it's me. Um, well, how are you going to afford it? I said, I don't know, but I'm going. And that's all there is to it. Well, let's look at the book then and go back as always to the beginning. Um, when did you and the sea meet? I was a small boy. We lived, uh, during the war, we lived on the Wirral. Um, Dad was working for a shipping company before he volunteered for the army. And um, so we spent the war up there, and of course we were a few hundred yards from uh, getting down to the, the sand and the sea. And, you know, I got fascinated by it then. Um, I built my first boat when I was four, out of an orange box, nailed bits of it together, launched it on the D, stood on it and sank. Well, that was an early introduction to Archimedes principle, which I didn't understand at the time but I got the message that actually I needed more wood in this thing if it was going to stay afloat. The first chapter, in fact, in the book is called Are Seamen Born or Bred? Mm. Were you born or bred? I am always puzzled over that one. It's like leadership, isn't it? Uh, a leader's born or bred. I believe you can train leaders. I don't believe it is the monopoly of one particular class of person. I think you've got some brilliant leaders if they're given the right encouragement. And I think seamen perhaps the same, but I think it comes down to how much you want to do it. And if you really want to do it, you're almost breeding yourself into it. But you're also being trained for it as well. So I, I'm never quite sure about that. I think if you've got the interest in it, if the seam the romance of the sea initially, because that's what it is when you're very young. And as you grow up, perhaps people realize you're interested. Then they start programming you, because all your birthday and Christmas presents are books about the sea. So you slowly get programmed into wanting to go to sea, which is what really happened to me. And um, I never regretted that. Um, I wanted to go to sea from about the age of eight, and that was it. I mean, my life really has been dictated by an eight-year-old. Certainly has. Uh, your family's interesting because you've got a bit of Scottish blood in there, a bit of Irish blood, um, and a, a bit of uh, pugilism as well in the background. Well, I think um, any, any family that uh, 400 years ago was given the choice of being drowned, hung, or go to Northern Ireland must have done something to cause them to threaten them that way. So I think probably we were fairly pugilistic. Um, and, of course, that's my father's side of the family, and they've been in Ulster now for well, over 400 years, still got relatives farming there. Um, 
But I think um, it was just survival in those days. I mean, if you were brought up in the borders of Scotland in the 16th century, um, there was always fighting going on. I mean, the last big tribal battle in British soil was 1596 at Strift Sands, where the Johnstons and the Maxwells decided to have it out. I mean, the 700 Maxwells killed, and God knows how many Johnstons. I mean, it was, this wasn't exactly a peaceable time. The first uh, boat was an orange box affair, but you then, uh, as many schoolboys do, see a plan for a kayak. I did, and I couldn't afford it, so I dropped my own plans and built my own boat, um, which was 10 feet long. Not the most beautiful of boats, I have to say, and I learned quite a lot about drawing out lines from the failures, but, but it got me afloat. And um, I used to you know, put it on top of the car when we went to the seaside, which was normally in Selsey. My grandmother lived there. And uh, I'd, I'd just take it down and go, go canoeing. I mean, I was blissfully happy. I'm, I'm now master of my, my own life. I can go where I like in my canoe. It was absolutely marvellous. I loved it. It's a great sense of freedom, isn't it, as an eight-year-old, to be able to do that? Well, uh, this was later. I was 14 at the time I built that. At eight, I decided I wanted a dinghy, and um, I saw one advertised in the sailing dinghy, 15 pounds. The next three years, every penny I got went into that pot. And when I was 11, I had 15 pounds, but the boat now cost 20, so I never got it. So uh, it was rather sad. I think perhaps if I got that dinghy, it might have got things out of my system. I never have gone to sea, but you never know. So when did you and the sea really get to properly together? I mean, that's just messing around in boats, but you know, when did it become serious? Well, I suppose in a way, um, we still had national service. Um, so to make sure I went into the Navy, I joined the RMVR. Did two weeks on HMS Vanguard down in Plymouth as our last battleship. Uh, I think about a thousand of us on board, about a hundred of us are RMVRs. And, you know, I loved it. I, I thought it was absolutely marvellous. Um, but um, I was also drawn to the Merchant Navy and a friend from school joined a company and I got interested and I thought, well, hmm, let's have a look at that. Got the brochure and applied and was accepted. So February 57 I went to sea as an apprentice in the Merchant Navy. A decision I've never regretted. I'm so glad I did that. It made me grow up. Um, you know, I was quite small. Fairly pugilistic, but I was small. But within that year, I grew three inches and put on two stone, and it was just muscle. And it was just hard work and good food. And I've never, it gave me a very strong body, which I've been very grateful for ever since. But I loved it. I, loved it. Um, I thought the life was marvelous. The um, responsibility was given, because the company had two ships, so they took the crew off, manned it entirely with apprentices. So we got a lot of responsibility, and, it, uh, and I loved it. I thought it was really marvellous. We were really encouraged. Great captain, marvellous man. He was a reservist. He'd sunk three U-boats, commissioned Loch Farda. Lovely man. God, we respected him. But all the officers, I mean, all the older officers, had been through the war. And they sort of felt, well, there could be another war. We're going to train you up in case. So they were fairly strict with us, and they made us learn. But thank goodness they did. And that was a true apprenticeship, wasn't it? Learning the ropes, I think, is the title or chapter in the book, but it is learning the ropes rather than perhaps learning the computer nowadays. Yes, we didn't have computers then anyway, but um, no, I mean, it was all hands on. I mean, you were learning from a seamanship instructor who was a, um, what was called in those days, a white uh, boatswain from New Zealand Steam, marvellous boat called Bertie Miller. Taught me so much. Um, and Again, ruthless with us. Um, you know, we learned, and if the work wasn't done properly after tea in the evening, you came back and redid it. So you learned to do it right first time. <laughs> but I mean, with people like that training you, it was very difficult not to turn out well. Yes, and uh, few, few and far between those kind of people nowadays. Really, I'm afraid they are hard to come by. I think everything's got a little softer and I'm not sure it's awfully good for young people. I think they need the challenge of being forced to maintain high standards and you'll find they'll rise to it. Um, you know, 99 out of 100 will rise to that and respond to it very positively but we don't demand it of them and I think it's a mistake.
Um, you spent a lot of time here, well, we're in Gosport Marina here, but uh, you spent quite a lot of time here uh, in the Merchant Navy and the, doing the Naval Reserve bit at Whale Island. That's, uh, there's a great chapter in there about the tales and uh, mischief you got up to. Well, I, I, once I got my second mate certificate, um, I, they threw me out of the RMVR when I went to the Merchant Navy. So I rejoined um, when I got my second mate certificate. Because we had skills they wanted. Um, we were navigators, but we're also watchkeepers. So we got experience, and um, I was accepted. And for the next five years, I held the dizzy rank of acting probationary sub lieutenant, mainly because I went out east and I wasn't around the UK. Because um, my company had more than half its fleet based out around India. And um, so I spent the next four and a half years going from Bombay to Basra and back every month, um, which was interesting time in those days before aircraft took over and before the ports were built there was only one port then that was Kuwait and Basra apart from Bombay and Karachi so it was it was still adventurous then there was still you get the Bedouins traveling on board marvelous people um, never gave you any trouble at all polite if you were polite with them they were so willing to be reasonable not everyone was that easy I have to say but uh, on the whole but it was fascinating, people camping on the decks. I mean, four and a half thousand ton ship, we could take 700 deck passengers. So it's a vast number. You think that's smaller than the ferries that cross the channel. And yet we were taking probably about five times as many people. <laughs> but they camped on the decks. And um, you'd walk around the smell of the cooking their curries. How we didn't have more fires with their kerosene stoves, I don't know. We were remarkably fire free. Uh, fire free. We weren't bomb free, but we were fire free. So those are cargo ships which take passengers, but um, this is pre-containers, isn't it? Yes, it was. Containers. We knew about containers, but they hadn't really taken off at that stage. They hadn't started building the container ships, which 10 years later were dominating shipping. And that's, I presume, where you have your famous taste of curries come from in that way. Well, um, you see, with Indian crews, um, we had curry on the menu every lunch. So, and they were extremely good curries. So. Uh, temptation was to eat them but you, you could walk around the tween decks we had what was called the Vichy Wallers and they would make meals for the deck passengers and um, very good ones too and uh, that was a private contract but if you went into them and said I want a naan roti they'd just cook you one and the absolutely delicious naans crisp warm oh I used to send one of the quartermasters down to get me one every morning and captain would come on the bridge and, what have you got there third uh, Nan Rachel said, where do you get that? Fishy was. Oh, what's it like? Well, try a bit, sir. Well, he said, that's very good. You get me one? Yes, sir. Say to the quartermaster, go and get one for the captain's sub. <laughs> those, I know you look back in the book so fondly with those times. They were marvellous times, Steve. I mean, uh, A, it was still, the Gulf was undeveloped. I mean, Dubai was at Muddy Creek. Uh, Bahrain, we anchored. Qatar, we anchored. Bushar, we anchor, that's in Iran. Um, we never went alongside in Koran Mashal, although there were berths, but Basra would be turned round, and then we'd come back visiting all these places, places like Muscat, for instance, Guada and Pasni on the Makran coast, Karachi and then Bombay. But there was still a romance about it, you know, there was still, you were reading Thessinger about crossing the empty quarter, because it hadn't happened much before. Most of our agents were people who were really into the Arab way of life. Um, you might say they'd gone native, but they were fascinating people and they understood the Arabs and got on very well with them. And it, it was a fascinating time. It was only spoilt by the um, rebellion in Amman, which um, led to one of our ships being blown up, uh, about 238 killed. And uh, we had a, that was off Dubai, 1961. We had a bomb about three months later, which went on number one hatch. We were very lucky, only one person slightly burnt, and the damage all went into the air. But uh, then we had a series of these bombs, and um, the company, quite rightly, originally put young third officers on the job of its security. Well, we didn't have a clue. So they started recruiting ex-Palestine policemen, and they were a hard bunch. <laughs> they were fascinating people. Most of them were served in about six colonial police forces. There's stories that keep you up all night just listening fascinating people. You married your childhood sweetheart in that time? I did. I, um, we were allowed flying leave after 
between a year and 18 months on a two and a half year contract. So I decided to do it and take my mate's ticket and got married at the same time. And of course, we were very young. I mean, I was 22, she was 20. But you know, we'd known each other since we were kids and, um, and we could get a, a marriage allowance if we went out to Bombay. So Sue flew out, I went out, joined a ship in Bahrain, got to Bombay, started flat hunting, Sue arrived and we got a flat and moved in, and um, that was really our lives. It was fortunate there was a very good swimming club called Beach Candy, which gave everyone somewhere to go. About 50 of us had our wives out there. It was a good place for them to meet and look after each other, which they did. And we were in port one week in four, which in the Merchant Navy was pretty darn good. So, um, no, it was, um, they were good times. At what point then did you, on the bridge of a lovely cargo ship with your curries and, 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 and everything else, taking cargo and passengers around uh, the, the coast there. Did it occur to sail around the world? It didn't occur then at all. Um, the idea of Suheni came about, um, I went back and was senior third officer and a junior third officer joined who'd been with me on the cadet ship and we'd been friends there, Peter Jordan. And I was taking over from at midnight and we, the radar was not working as usual and we were between Muscat and Karachi, and we suddenly saw a flicker of light. We realized it was a Dow, so we altered course to avoid it. Um, they didn't bother with lights unless they saw a threat coming. I suppose we're a four and a half thousand ton threat. And um, we got talking about it, and that conversation slowly developed into the idea of getting a Dow and sailing it home at the end of our contract. Well, I wrote to Alan Villiers, um, famous for his um, skippering square riggers pre-war and he'd spent a year on a Dow, fascinating book called Sons of Sinbad. I wrote to him and said what do you think? Well this unknown, my second officer by then, writing and asking the question, you know, what do you think? And he sent me a three page handwritten letter back which I'm still trying to find because it was just full of sensible advice. We said alright, we won't build a Dow because we'd never sell it, we'll build a yacht. So we wrote off the plans. The plans we asked for didn't come through. Plans for Suheli came. We said, well, look, she looks seaworthy. Let's build her. So we built uh, Suheli. But the plan then was just sail her home and then sell her, um, and then go back to sea. Well, she took longer to build. You know, things do take time in India. And uh, he and the other guy joined us, another third officer, decided they weren't going to wait any longer. So I bought them out. And. Um, finished the boat off with my brother and a friend, and um, we set off from Bombay just before Christmas 1965 on sail for Muscat, and um, then Salada, then Mombasa, and then down the East African coast till we got to Durban, where we ran out of money, so we all took jobs. I got a job as captain of a ship. Um, Chris went to work, he was a Lloyds broker, went to work for an uh, insurance company. And Heinz, who worked for Marconi, went back to sea as a radio operator. And then we reformed about eight months later and carried on the voyage. You had um, a bit of a tricky time, I think, uh, shipping there, uh, running um, sometimes what you thought was not quite correct in terms of cargo, a bit of illegal. Yeah, um, it was absolutely disgraceful because uh, we were given a false manifest. Um, you know, the uh, mate would load the ship and, um, you know, he was loading what he was told was coming down. And we were on our way up to Barra uh, from Durban, and he said, Skip, you better come and look at this. And I've got the deck covered with what I thought was, um, according to the manifest, lubricants for radiation railways, which was allowed. And he said, it's the flashpoint. I said, Christ, let's open them. They're full of aviation spirit, which was completely embargoed. Well, we're just about in Barra, and I thought, hmm. I don't know what we do about this, because uh, I turn the ship round now, all hell break loose. Um, and we're very vulnerable, both he and I were British. So he carried on and um, got it discharged. And I, when I got back to Durban, I went to the owner and just said, you just cannot do that. And we had a major row. Um, he said, I can't talk to him right now. And I said, I certainly can. You know, I'm not here to breach embargoes. Um, and I'm a British subject and I'm not going to do it. You'll do what I tell you. I said, I will not. Well, I realised the writing was on the wall, um, but then I got jaundice anyway, which made it very easy for him to set me, so, which he duly did. But he lost out because he was Mr. Big, and um, just before we sailed, he just gave me a bill for the chap who'd 
come on to back me up. I thought it's a dirty trick. But when I got home, I was taken out by the directors and asked what, how I got on in Durban. And I told them. And he had the P&O agency and he lost it. Now, it's not due to me, although I think I was a little contributory factor. One of our other ships, which went from Durban to Bombay, had also he'd done the same thing. And uh, the company just weren't prepared to have it, and rightly, you know. Um, so anyway, I um, had my row, and uh, that was the end of my time as captain of my first command. But then you sailed uh, Suheili back to home waters, as it were. Yeah, we sailed down the coast to Cape Town, and uh, then we thought, well, you know, we've done quite a lot of sailing now, we're quite experienced. So we said, let's go and stop home, let's get home. So we stocked up for, I think, 80 days or 90 days, I forget now. And so then off we went. And 77 days later, we arrived at Gravesend. So, which was incredibly useful for me because it made me see how much food you need on a long journey and what you need on board. 77 days in those days was a long voyage. <coughs> so in a way, it was perfect training for going around the world. And that's what uh, then happened, of course. Um, the, the, the announcement of a race, you'd seen what had happened already. Well, I'd already decided to do it. Um, I went back to sea with the company. I was put on the Kenya as first officer. Saw Chichester come home and thought, that's it. I, I've really got to do this. And um, I had a literary agent. I was writing a book about the first voyage. I'd never actually finished. It's mainly in that book now. Um, and he said, what are you doing for money? I said, I'll rob a bank and I'm going. Um, and he said, no, leave it with me. And so he approached the Sunday Times and said, I've got this chap who wants to try and exceed what you has done. Well, they decided a merchant navy officer wouldn't know how to sail, so they decided I wasn't the right person. Um, I believe the managing editor said, well, I couldn't support me. I wasn't a member of the Royal Yacht Squadron. Fat chance a merchant navy officer had of being a member of the Royal Yacht Squadron in those days. Um, so they said no, but then, in March following year, by which time I was on a frigate doing some Navy time, they just announced I was in a race they were organising. I never actually entered, you know. I never signed a bit of paper. Uh, they just said I was in it. Oh, OK. It must be, I suppose. I didn't think about it. But they got quite funny because they said, we're going to start the race on the 31st of October. You will be ready. I said, I should be off Cape Town by then. But why? I said, because of the seasons of the year. We won't be able to be in our race. I said, they're catching on fast. They just didn't have a clue. Um, they appointed Chichester as uh, race director, race chairman, but he was in New Zealand at the time, so they made all the rules without consulting him. Of course, he got back and found he'd got some crazy rules he couldn't change. Um, he and I became very good friends subsequently, so I got the inside dope from him. And um, it, it was, I mean, there were some crazy rules. So anyway, he said, well, when are you going to go? I said, 1st of June. And uh, two others, Che Blythe and John Ridgway, both said the same as me. So they realized they were losing a third of their entries. <laughs> they, they changed the rules. You can go any time between the 1st of June and the 31st of October. And that gave them a complication because they got this prize for the first person to make the voyage. What about someone leaving a bit later who was faster? So that's when they offered money for the fastest. So, um, I mean, as far as I was going to, it was first I was interested. I want to be the first to do this. You know, that is it. Did I think I would be? No. I had people out there with bigger boats who were perhaps, um, I was perhaps somewhat psyched by the fact they were members of yacht clubs in the UK. I'd probably got more miles than they had. In fact, I had. There was only one person who got more miles than me, and that was Matessi, and we were pretty close in mileage. Um, in fact, he and I were the most experienced who set out. But that wasn't appreciated at the time, except by the editor of Yachting World, Bernard Heyman, who just wrote in the editorial that watch Knox Johnston. He's got a lot of experience under his belt and he knows his boat. <laughs> and no one else believed me, but he did. The Round the World race, um, you know, it seems quite a long time ago, but for you, I know in the book you've already written about that, uh, A World on My Own, uh, and wow, well, an amazing experience. I think one of the things that came out for me um, in that whole thing is learning how to deal with a small boat in the Southern Ocean and self-steering and trailing warps as a sailor. That was a big thing, wasn't it? Oh, I think it's one of the reasons I'm alive. Um, the last thing I bought before I left was a coil of two-inch polypropylene, 17 pounds it cost, 
probably the best investment I've ever made. There was very little experience of the Southern Ocean. Chichester's book wasn't out. Rose was still at sea when I left. Uh, the Smeatons were the only people you could really read about. Uh, Dumas, perhaps the Argentine. Um, the Smeatons had been pitch poled in a bigger boat than Suheli. Now, I'd seen the Southern Ocean from the deck of a large merchant ship, but um, not been in it in a small boat. Well, apart from going around the Cape in Suheli, and we'd have fairly benign weather. You knew it was nasty. You knew there were waves there that can reach 80 feet, sometimes more. Um, our communications were pretty lousy in those days. You had single soundband radios, limited power, 75 watts. Um, a lot of the time you couldn't get through anyway. And in case my radio packed up just after passing Cape Town, so I had no communication after that. So you're really on your own and you're doing what you've done habitually, which with Sue Haley had been to take the sails down and leave her. And she'd fly beam on and just roll a bit, but she was fine. But in the Southern Ocean, you couldn't do that. The waves are too powerful. They were slamming into her. And doing a refit a couple of years back, I mean, I came across two frames that had cracked from then. It was like someone swinging anvil against the hull. You realize she's not going to last. She can't take this. Um, and I was just standing there thinking, what on earth do I do? But well, what do we do with lifeboats? We put out a sea anchor. Sea anchor, yeah. I've got one, but that's pretty taut. I must have read somewhere about trying warps. I must have read it from somewhere. I don't believe I invented it. And I thought, I know, I'll get that rope out and put it out. So I put it out from one side of the boat, around the stern, and back on the other side, and then paid it out. So there's about um, 150, a bit under 150 yards before its bite, you know, as it, come, it turns the other end. And so he just swung stern too, and she lay perfectly. And I just happened to strike, by chance more than anything, the right thing to do in those conditions. And after that, frankly, when I got really bad weather, I put that warp out and I go to bed. There's nothing I can do. You know, that I can't sail her in these strength of winds. You know, when you, you put your head up through that hatchway, look aft, and you're blinded by spindrift for about a minute. It's so sharp. You think, no, nothing I can do. I'll get some rest. I'll wait for it to subside, and then I'll get sailing again. And really, that's all you could do. It's a great part of your life around the world. How much do you think it changed you all that time alone out on the water? Um, I think it made me more self-dependent. Um, when I've decided that something's the right thing to do, you're not going to change me. I will think it through. I don't usually rush to these things. I will sit and mull for a while. But once I've made my mind up, then I'm going to do it, and that's it. And, um, and I'm going to do it that way. Because that's what I had to do. Um, so an interesting comment actually was made by one of my friends who'd saw me off um, from the publisher of Castles. He was asked what I was like, and he said, he's much more relaxed now when I got back. It's interesting, isn't it? I suppose I'd, I was 30 by then. I suppose I've got something out of my system. Um, maybe, maybe not. And bearded, of course. Well, yeah, because he forgot to put the razor blades on board. <laughs> Lovely man. I love the part in the, the book where uh, you describe you're in cows and um, a gent this is before the, the round, going around the world, a gentleman, a well-dressed yachting gentleman came up to you and said, you can't do that on your own. It's not quite what he said. What he said is, are you with Johnny who thinks he's going to sail single-handed non-stop around the world? And I was actually in the Navy at the time, but the ship was in Portsmouth, and I'd gone over to check my boat at Suter's. And I said, oh. I said, oh, I'm certainly going to try it. He said, oh, well, it's, not, it's not possible. In any case, you couldn't do it. I thought, what a stupid comment. You don't know me. You've never met me before. You've no idea what I'm like. And I said, so, Silly man. I said, you're not a schoolmaster, are you? Certainly not. I said, why? I said, You'd be bloody depressing for your students. You can't say that. I said, I just effing have. I never saw him again. I expect he went to his club that evening. I told that young idiot Knox Johnson he doesn't stand a chance. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I didn't see him after I got back. 
The welcome, of course, is famous, and uh, it must have been a, a, an amazing day to step off the boat, off Suheili, after all that time. And we're not talking about months here, we're talking about nearly a year, aren't we? You know? Yeah, 312 days, 10 and a half months. Yeah, it was, um, it was what people don't realise. I'm coming in, and they said to me, can you, what time are you going to finish? They said, 9 o'clock. Um, ah, do you mind slowing up? I said, do me a favour. You know, I've been at sea for 312 days. Why do you want me to slow up? Well, the Mary Maris are going to greet you, but she's got a hair appointment at 9 o'clock, so do you mind slowing up? I said, OK, all right. You feel very friendly, you know, you're seeing people for the first time. And, uh, well, I saw some people off New Zealand, some fishermen, but that was it. I hadn't seen anyone for four and a half months. And um, nearly five months. And so I said, oh, all right, slow up. Of course, the wind changed. So it took me till 3.20 in the afternoon to cross the finish line. <laughs> over which there was a dispute between me and the Sunday Times as to where the finish line was. Since they weren't there when I set out, I didn't see how they knew, but anyway, I was thinking, all right, I'll go over your finish line. But um, everyone's making a big song and dance, and I was thinking, what's happening to Suheili? Um, no, no, it's all, all on the ground. I said, what's happening to Suheili? I haven't got an engine now. Um, where's she going? You know, because if you don't, haven't got a mooring for her, I'm turning around and going back out. Because you, your priority is your boat. You know, that, that's got me around the world, this, this thing. And um, I'm not going to just let someone else take her over. I am going to moor her. I want to make sure she's safe. So eventually they told me I, I got a mooring. They put a line on and I managed to sort her out. And then um, I had a few drinks with my brothers on board. Um, there was a Navy minesweeper came to meet me, gave us some pusses rum, which was extremely nice. And we went ashore. And of course, the first thing is, um, I haven't slept on land for nearly a year, so I'm just sort of feeling my feet to see, you know, what's this feel like, you know? And I hadn't realised how weak my ankles had become. Um, you know, I, I couldn't walk 200 yards without sitting down. they just become so weak. Massively strong up here, but because hard physical work, but you don't use your legs. So I walked up to the top of the thing with the um, Commodore of the Royal Cormon, lovely man called Fox, and, uh, and then everything sort of erupted. I mean, you've got everyone shouting at you, everything else. <coughs> and we're surrounded by journalists and things. And um, Sunday Times never actually said, well done. Their first comment to me was, oh, Mr. Knox Johnson, my detective's finishing in six weeks. We're expecting royalty and admirals. You will be there, won't you? I said, well, where are they for me then? I've just won the bloody thing. No, anyway, I didn't worry about it too much. But they had security people who was blocked down. And he'd always supported me. And they were in my way. And I said, Can let my father through? No, so I pushed them aside. One of them fell over and uh, wanted to see Dad. And I wasn't having anyone getting in my way, and that was final. So. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the Round the World is a story in its own. And uh, from there, you got involved in bigger boats and crewed. Uh, and of course, um, I suppose we should talk about the Whitbread around the world race, which was based here. So, well, when I first got back, I was going to go back to sea. Um, but my company, McKinsey's did a report, and my company disappeared. It all became the P&O Group. We'd been part of it, but we were independent and mm, didn't want that. An actual fact, like an awful lot of my age group, our jobs disappeared at that time. Um, we all had to find, well, I was lucky. At least I'd got that behind me. We set up a syndicate and bought a boatyard on the Hamble and then built Mercury Marina. And then ranks, well, we couldn't get money from the bank. Banks won't lend you money on the security of a muddy hole, which is what a marina is half built. So we got the rank organisation involved. <laughs> and then we took over Port Hamill. So I ran that for a bit. And, um, but I kept sailing because um, 70 we built Ocean Spirit, did the Round Britain race, the Cape Rio race. It was with Clement Freud as chef, he was marvellous. Um, 73, I was out and cupping with Robin Asher on Frigate. 74, another round Britain race, that's when we had the big cat, the British Oxygen, the biggest racing cat ever built at the time. We won again. 75, I was cut, but I got injured. 76, I raced more opposition and won the Rock Class 1 points championship. 77, Whitbread. And so we did the Whitbread. Um, and a bit of a disaster, really, because we had a carbon fiber mast and it hadn't been designed properly, so it broke on the first leg. So there was no chance of any place in the race. 
all we could do was go for line honours. I skippered second and fourth legs, and I managed to get line honours on both of them, but that was about it. But good crew, fun doing it, and the main thing was I beat Tarbally for the last one, last leg. So. Famous boat, and beautiful too, because uh, Heath Condor was, uh, was wood. Yeah, she was. Well, there's a funny story about that. We were in Auckland, and I come in first, and um, I was walking around, and there's these chaps, you know, dressed floppy hats and things. And I just got chatting to them, and they said, oh, you know, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we've been told um, we can go out sailing on the best looking boat here. I said, well, I've got that. Come and have a look. And they said, well, could we go sailing tomorrow? I said, yeah, sure. Um, you know, found out who they were, didn't mean anything to me. Went on board and said to the crew, oh, we're going sailing tomorrow, chaps. Oh, come on, skipper, you know, we want to do this. I said, why? I said, oh, some pop group. Um, I've offered to take them out sailing. Who are they? I said, something Mac. They went, Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, that's them. Fleetwood Mac. Said, are they famous? I said, <laughs> they were delightful. We ended up on stage for their concert there, which is enormous. In fact, the drummer dislocated his finger. Our doctor was there and put it back in the middle of the concert. They were delightful, utterly charming, and I've followed them ever since. Um, Multi-holes, big cats, uh, actually featured quite strongly because uh, it wasn't long before Enza came along and that's uh, an attempt at the uh, Jules Verne trophy to sail around the world in under 80 days, which of course it hadn't happened by then. Yeah, you know, that was my fourth big cat actually because we had British Oxygen, then I had Sea Falcon, then I had British Airways, I actually got sponsorship that time, and then of course Enza came along. Now that came about because Peter Blake and I were on the Whitbread committee and we were leaving together, you know, obviously we sailed around the world together, we'd done a lot together, we were very good friends. And um, he said, you heard about this Jules Verne thing? I said, yeah. He said, thinking of doing it? I said, well, if I could find the sponsorship, yes, I would. He said, what's your plan? I said, the biggest multi-hull catamaran I can lay my hands on. What about you? He said, yep, yep, I'm gonna, I'm talking to Farah about a big monohull with pods you can put water into to really blast it, it was pre-foils. I said, how are you getting on? No, not too good. I said, and Peter said, how about teaming up? I said, why not? So we did. And uh, we met the New Zealand Apple and Pear Marketing Board. And as we walked out of the meeting, we said, Peter said, how do you think that went? I said, I thought it went rather well. I said, oh Lord, what have we done now? <laughs> so, <laughs> and Peter shot over to New Zealand to sign the deal. I shot over to the States to look for Mike Birch's big cat which was really the only one around that was big enough for what we wanted. And um, checked her over and said, yeah, okay, we've got to do some work on her, but basically she's sound. So we met up again and said, right, that's it, let's do it. And we didn't want anyone to know we were after that cat because that would have put the price up. So we went to this um, press conference in Paris. It was hilarious. Um, my French isn't particularly good. Um, so I wanted to explain about the apple and pear marketing board, so I bought an apple and pear in the market. And I said to them, you know, um, Peter and I would like to make a statement, yes, 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 but you're sweet, uh, we have a uh, famous Frenchman, I'm going to tell us what they are doing. And um, Perron got up and announced what he was doing, and we knew about him. Very good sailor, definitely com uh, keen competition. And there were others, and then he got talking about someone who's going to try racing the Atlantic, and I said, excuse me, no, no, you must wait. I said, we're talking about around the world here. Anyway, eventually let me speak. I said, well, Peter and I have an announcement. You've all heard of the All Blacks. Oh, rugby. Oh, you, 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 you. Soon you're going to hear about the New Zealand Apple and Pear Marketing Board, Enzo. And I held up the Apple and Pear and I put them down. And Bernard Matessier was there. He leant across, picked up the pear, took a knife out and started peeling it at natives. <laughs> well, you can imagine. Um, and Peter and I said we were going to be there on the start line, they went very quiet because they knew we don't take prisoners. And um, we went the next day to pick the boat up, sailed her back across the Atlantic, took her into what was Ferries, Humble Point, and well, Nigel Irons obviously got involved because he designed her originally. And we got her ready and then we went to France and um, basically set off with uh, uh, Bruno Perron. Um, in fact, I think we set off slightly earlier. And it was very level pegging all the way down to the Southern Ocean. And then he got about 100, 150 miles ahead of us. That was half a day at those speeds. And we were very happy because we weren't breaking anything. We were just keeping that boat in one piece. And he was breaking things every day. And we thought, we're just going to sit here. 
But then we hit something in the water and had to pull out, which was a tragedy. And we thought, well, that's the end of it. Came home, we brought the boat into Cape Town, had it shipped home. And then the Appleton Pair Marketing Board said, Are you guys up for doing it again? And we said, is the Pope a Catholic? Why? Is it? We've just looked at our sales figures. They went shooting up when you were doing that. And they did tie in a very good marketing program, which is the secret. You know, you don't just rely on the boat. You, you do a proper professional job, which they did. And I uh, said, so, yeah, right. So um, we shipped the boat out to New Zealand. Dave Allen Williams did a lot of work on it. And we lengthened her. And we all went out and sailed around New Zealand entertaining the Apple and Pear Fathers. And she was a different boat. I mean, she was so much more lively. I mean, leaving uh, Dunedin, squall came through. We're up to 32 knots in no time. You know, it's, uh, we're just saying, wow, this boat goes. So we had another go at it against um, a very good friend of mine called Olivier de Cursison. And um, we set off more or less at the same time, cross tacked off the Spanish coast, and then we started leaving. And we built up a pretty good lead on him actually by halfway. <coughs> it took us 35 days to get from Brest to off New Zealand. And then we ran into some really peculiar weather, slowed us right down. And Olivier caught, he was 1,500 miles behind, he caught up within 300 miles. And we got round the horn, and it was more bad weather, got round okay. And then, of course, everyone's panicking because Olivia's going close to the South American coast. Well, that isn't where the winds are, are suitable. We went out and he said, He's catching us, he said, just relax. It'll work out, don't worry about it. Well, of course, he got hit by headwinds eventually and slowed up. And uh, we came in to Brest. Bruno Perron had bust the 80 days by a few hours. We then took another five days off it, brought it down to just under 75 days. And we got a fabulous welcome in Brest. I must say, the French were brilliant. But when Olivier arrived two days later, of course, wow, it's even bigger because the Bretons are fairly independent. So it didn't matter that we had actually got the record. He was the fastest Breton. And that's all that matters in the world. And I jumped on board and said, uh, congratulations, Olivier, well done. He looked at me and said, Robin, I hate you. And of course, the press got us both laughing. <laughs> We've known each other a long time. And you finished that race just as the same, using the same technique as you had in the Southern Ocean with uh, Sir Haley. Basically, yeah, because you see, during the race, uh, not far after Cape Town, we were going so fast, we overtook the wave in front, then slowed down, and we slammed into the back of the next wave. Peter was coming out of the hatch and got thrown back, and it chipped one of his vertebrae. So we had him in his bun for about 10 days. I mean, he had quite a lot of pain. Um, and we thought, well, we can't ha have that happen again. Um, we had to do it again off Cape Horn, the same thing. But we're coming at the finish. We said, the boat's in one piece. We could, we could speed up. We're not going to. We're just going to get ourselves across that finish line. The record's in the bag. This point is trying to save two or three hours and, and lose a mast. So we came in, yes, with anchor was out the back. We had everything out the back. <laughs> just to slow us down. After that, you go on to a bit more single-handing, um, and uh, a bit I particularly love um, is uh, some experiments in navigation and uh, using an astrolabe. Well, you know, I'm a professional, I'm a navigator, and um, it's always fascinated me, and I love maritime history. How did they navigate in the great age of exploration, which is really the 16th century, end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th? And how, for instance, did Columbus get across the Atlantic? And you read his diary. How could he be so certain that San Salvador was in the Spanish part of the world and not the Portuguese? Because the world was divided that way at the time by the Pope. When in fact, San Salvador wasn't. It was in the Portuguese area. How did he know? Um, did he know? I think he did. Um, but when he got back, there was an immediate meeting between the Spanish and Portuguese, and they shifted the angle around to that, which is why Brazil speaks Portuguese and the rest of South America speaks Spanish to this day. Um, it's all very interesting, a lot going on. But I wanted to see how well he could have navigated, and the only way to do it was to actually replicate it. So I went to the National Maritime Museum and said, can I make a copy of the, an astrolabe you've got, a Portuguese one? They said, certainly, and he let me do it. And I got um, the Guardian and Barclays. Barclays paid for the tracking, and the Guardian followed it. 
with school program. So I would radio in twice a week to Bob Fisher and say what I thought it was. So I had no time. You can't have time. Give me time. I'll work out roughly where I am. Um, so I'd sort of say, oh, it's Thursday. I meant to talk to Bob today. Uh, sun rose at this time and this far west. Mm, about an hour's time. You know, you can work out. When the sun's about there, I'm going to switch off. And I'd wait and then start calling up. And I'd tell Bob where I thought I was. And he, of course, was getting the tracking results. And this was being compared by The Guardian to the schools. Which, were, I mean, the school children were just brilliant. I mean, you've got a little girl being interviewed. Well, he's doing quite well, really, considering. <laughs> it's wonderful comments. Get honesty from youngsters, don't you? Yes, you do. Um, the classic question is, what do you do at night? What do you, you, know, what well, do, you do at right. night? That's right, yes. What do you do at night? Do you anchor? No, I can't do that. Uh, the other great one was a lady came up to me after I'd been around the world and said, weren't you worried when you were missing? Because I couldn't talk to anyone for four and a half months and no one knew where I was. I said, well, no, madam, because I knew where I was. She said, no, but you were missing. No, madam, I knew where I was. <laughs> after the single-handed, um, you must have got something about mountaineering because you went up to the Antarctic, Chris Bonington, and, and got into climbing. How, how, how did that come about? That actually started in 1979. Um, Chris was writing a book called Quest for Adventure, and there was a chapter about me in it. And he said, you know, I'd like to get to know you. We had the same literary agent. And he said, I'd like to get to know you better. Can I come sailing with you? And I was taking Sue and Sarah up for a cruise in the Western Isles anyway. I said, well, we go, what's around? He said, well, there's the Coolins on Sky. We can do that. I said, OK. So we went up and anchored in a lovely little bay in the south end. And he and I did the Coolin Ridge together. And he took me out the day before, and we climbed this mirror. I mean, I don't know how you hung onto it, but he did. I don't know how he did it. Um, <laughs> Why am I doing this? This is thoroughly unsafe. <laughs> but we struck up a very good friendship. We said, you know, we should do that again. And it took us. I dropped Chris off at Tobin Moray on the way back, and that was the night the fastest storm came through. And I went and found a sheltered anchorage and stayed up all night just in case. Um, it took us 11 years before we put it together. And then we went up to Greenland and he found an unclimbed mountain. We went up in Suheili, got through the ice. I had two sailors with me to look after the boat while I went off climbing. And it was the most marvellous adventure. Uh, it was Chris, Jim Lowther and me were the mountaineers. Um, we had a television producer and cameraman who fitted in very well. And I had the other two looking after the boat. And John Dunn came with us as far as Reykjavik. Let's bring things up again to, to this year, um, or most recently. Now, what do you think about all these hydrofoils flying on the water? How does that work for you? Well, I'm one of the three people who's been out with Ben, who aren't part of his team, on uh, Ineos. And I have to say, it, it is awesome. I mean, it, it's just unbelievable. That machine gets up on one foil with obviously a rudder, but that's it. And it's holding it absolutely upright so you're getting maximum effect from the wind. And we're getting 42 knots. I mean, you're just in awe of this thing. Um, and it accelerates amazingly quickly. And, but it just gets up and it's so smooth. Um, we were sailing off um, east side of the Isle of Wight and you know, it was a bit of a chop. Perhaps force four. And we had about six ribs following us, including a spy. And we were just sliding. These were bashing like this to try and keep up with us. He said, this is quite amazing. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect it to be so smooth, but it was. And of course, we had extra people on board. The crewing was brilliant, but extra people on board because the, the boffins are on board, you know, checking everything and trying to learn as much as they can for boat number two. Um, and how do you see that then applying to uh, sailing itself? I mean, obviously, the, the Vendée Globe, the Open Sixty, you were very much involved with that uh, from the outset. Uh, how do you think that's going to happen and come about? Well, we had, we had uh, foils in the last race, and if Alex hadn't broken a foil, he'd have won them. Uh, the winner had foils, um, but Alex was faster on the tack, which enabled him to use his foil, and quite a lot faster, actually. It'll be a lot more of them this time uh, with foils, and I think we're going to learn a lot more about it because 
It's pretty testing, the Southern Ocean, and if the foils can survive that, they did last time, apart from Alex hitting something, uh, I think we're going to learn a lot more. And I think foils will become more standard in certain types of racing. I mean, the moths have them anyway, and have for a long time. But I think we'll see them uh, becoming more acceptable in certain types of racing. Not totally, of course. I'm sure some cruising boats will get them, but I think the cost is going to be inhibiting factor. America's Cup, would you uh, like to be there for that? Oh, look, it's a young man's game. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have been out on it. Uh, I've seen what it's like. Uh, I'm envious. I wish I was 50 years younger, so I could be out on it. Uh, I'm very envious of the guys doing it because they are learning so much and they're getting some sailing, which is just out of this world. I mean, phenomenal sailing. But they're having to work hard to do it, and I, I admire them for that. I just want Ben to bring the cup back here. Well, there we must leave it. We've run out of time. But uh, my thanks to Sir Robin Knox Johnston, chairman of Clipper Ventures. We didn't even get to talk about Clipper and the fantastic job they've done for the past 20 odd years, 23 years, I think it is, and some 4,000 people taken to sail around the world and what a great adventure it is for them. So thank you to Robin. And don't forget, of course, the book Running Free is available. Thank you very much for participating in the Red Funnel Isle of Wight Digital Literary Festival. If you've enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation. Follow the Donate Now button from the homepage of our website. You can also benefit from great discounts by ordering via Blackwell's Bookshop from our homepage. We'd like to thank the loyal sponsors who've supported the Isle of Wight Literary Festival over the past years. Without their financial contribution, it would be difficult to attract the many wonderful speakers we've hosted, while keeping ticket prices down. This year, their support has enabled us to provide the digital festival free of charge. Special thanks to Red Funnel, who've been our title sponsor for many years, and, as well as providing financial support, offer a warm welcome to speakers and visitors to the island for the festival.